going on vinyl community welcome to another video with the record spinner in today's video i'm going to be doing a vinyl haul showcasing all of the records that i acquired within the months of november and december of 2023 now typically i would have done a november vinyl haul video a week after i did my record store day black friday haul but because of the holiday of kissmas and the 25 days of kissmas series that I, that i hosted on the channel where i reviewed every kiss studio album every day leading up to Christmas Day, and that's when I did a uh, updated Kiss vinyl collection video. Everything basically got pushed to the end of the year going into 2024. So that's why I'm covering two months in this video instead of one. Because I used to do um, bi-monthly vinyl haul videos uh, when I started the channel. But then those videos kind of went on a little bit in length. And then I reverted to just doing monthlies. So apologies if this video is a little bit on the longer side. But... We're rounding off the year as it is. But real quick, before we get into the haul, I want to give a major shout out to both a fan of the channel as well as a customer at the shop that I work at. His name is Tony, and he had come into the shop on the morning of Christmas Eve, which I was working. And he proceeded to give me these two records that he found at a local Goodwill. Now, I offered to give him something for them, just given what they are and the condition that they're in. But let's just say the fact that these were seen at a Goodwill, especially with today's climate with, you know, let's face it, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, when I go to a Goodwill, I constantly see like Barbara Streisand, Engelbert Humperdinck, Liberace. That's not my game whatsoever. So the fact that these just managed to slip the cracks and be at a Goodwill physical location is astounding. Get a load of this. And I'm going to say this is a little Christmas miracle. Sealed copies of both the Paul Stanley and Peter Chris 1978 solo albums. And look at the price. $2.49 each. An absolutely amazing gesture from Tony. And I cannot thank him enough for giving me these just as a gesture of pure goodwill. And you know what? It's funny because I mentioned that I did a Kiss Collection update video. This right here makes it outdated. So I don't know when I'm going to do an updated version and uh, show these again. But seriously, these are going to sit very nicely within my vintage Kiss vinyl pressings collection. So thank you so much, Tony. Now on to the haul. And there is a lot of good stuff in this haul that from these past two months. We got the Beatles. We got Third Man Records vault packages. Tons of Hendrix releases. More Donna's reissues. Some Kiss. Some uh, analog productions and Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab uh, reissues. And much, much more. It's about to go deep. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy the latest finds. Okay, so we are going to be kicking this haul off basically where my travels to California kind of left off at. So I'm sure you may have seen the video that I did with my good friends, the Stone Kings, where we did a sort of California record store hunt as well as a vinyl haul and some other fun adventures such as Catch, Kiss, and Guns N' Roses shows. It was an all-around fantastic time out on the West Coast, and I am eternally grateful for their hospitality as well as friendship. And uh, what many of you guys don't know is that we actually went to one more record store that was not featured in the video and that's just simply because the video was basically done being filmed and we managed to squeeze in one more record store before I made my way to LAX and flew back home so the store that we went to was Glass House Records uh, which is partially run by the guy that does Record Safari and um, killed some time at the shop and checked it out the way it's kind of laid out is that everything is kind Kind of just alphabetical like in sections there was no like artist cards or anything so if you were looking for something specific you really had to dig so needless to say i managed to make out pretty well with what i was able to find i found two pretty cool things uh picked up the self-titled debut album by the grateful dead and um i kind of went for this just because this is actually like my first proper grateful dead studio album uh because i already have skeletons from the closet as well as europe 72 and because of listening to europe 72 my favorite dead song is morning dew and that appears on this album and i figured if there's going to be a studio album to kind of start with sure there's you know working man's dead american beauty and 
such, but I figured a debut uh, release would be a solid place to start as well. And uh, my good friend Jenna over at Spins and Needles, who's part of the youngest members of the VC, was very proud of me for kind of pulling the trigger on this because she is an absolute humongous deadhead and um i'm really excited to dig into this and this is a rhino pressing from i want to say late 2000s early 2010s it's mastered by chris bellman and it does replicate the sort of gold warner brothers label which is really cool so i'm very excited to dig my way through this grateful dead album and then to kind of go Almost two decades later, in a sort of post-punk, gothy kind of vein, we have The Cure's Pornography. And uh, my coworker John, is a massive Cure fan, and he played me this album a little while ago. And I really enjoyed it for what it was. T to my ears, at least, this is like their most gothiest sounding album. And it just has a really cool vibe to it. I mean, even just down to the sort of ghoulish kind of artwork between the front and the back. It looks absolutely solid. So... That's a little Easter egg. For those of you that saw the California video, here are some extra pickups. All right, guys, now we're going to be digging into some King Crimson territory. DGM has just put out a couple of new vinyl releases about a couple weeks apart from each other, and I was very stoked to get my hands on them. Starting off with an anniversary release uh, for an album that's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, and that is... Lark's Tongues in Aspic. This is a fantastic Crimson record, one that is highly regarded in their discography. It's the only one to feature the lineup of Robert Fripp, David Cross, John Wetton, Bill Bruford, and Jamie Muir, and um, tons of Crimson classics on here. You have the title track parts one and two, Book of Saturday, Exiles, Easy Money, The Talking Drum. I just rattled off every song off the record, but it goes to show it's that good. Now, Stephen Wilson has sort of been re-revisiting um, his work with the Crimson Catalog, because he first remixed this album in stereo in 5.1 back in 2012, and now he's gone back and had another crack at it um, in 2023, this time around uh, mixing it in Dolby Atmos. And I do have to say, this remix sounds absolutely spatial and splendid. Uh, the way that certain things are mixed across the stereo spectrum, it makes for a more interesting listen than the 2012 mix. Um, and it's fantastic stuff. And then there's also the David Singleton Elemental Mixes, which kind of emphasize some components of the original mix that are a bit buried originally. So I think if you know this record off the back of your hand, uh, those elemental mixes will sound quite interesting. And um, it's an all-around solid package. And for the first time ever, the album has a gatefold jacket with a cool band photo on this side with some liner notes, as well as the insert uh, that was featured with the original album of the lyrics for the songs that had lyrics pressed on 200 gram vinyl sounds excellent definitely check this out for yourself you will not be disappointed and then going into modern crimson territory here is a very poignant document and that is their final ever u.s show and that is with the live release music is our friend uh this brings together the last like i said american crimson show at the anthem in washington dc on september 11th 2021 and there's also a couple of tracks from albany new york as well overall a solid set list as you can see here and um, the tracks from Albany are distinguished with asterisks. And instead of kind of including them as like bonus cuts after the show, they kind of um, interwove them into the sequence of the show to kind of make it a more complete sort of listening experience. And um, I just think a show like this is really nice to have on vinyl. It's not the last King Crimson show ever because that was in Japan, but it's cool for, you know, to have on American soil. It's a shame because I missed them on this tour. I really should have saw it. The last time I saw them was in 2019 for the 50th anniversary tour. But uh, this is a great triple LP set with a nice triple gatefold. We have some of Robert Fripp's diaries and some liner notes from uh, David Singleton. Great shot of the crowd here as well. Pressed on nice heavyweight vinyl as well. So if you want yourself a nice... Um, live souvenir of the modern crimson i would say this is the essential package to have alongside the live in toronto box set and then there's also the live at the orpheum release but that's a single lp you definitely want you want you want the full uh, effect here so very glad that i have this 
So that was what was released officially by DGM. And I hope that they don't come after me for getting this just because it is a little bit of a bootleg, but it's a really cool one. Um, most BBC recordings from the 60s going into 70s have sort of hit the public domain kind of vein. So a lot of these weird little offshoot labels will put them out and whatever. And uh, that's exactly the case uh, with this particular release. And that is, of course... King Crimson at the BBC in 1969. So this features the very first lineup of Robert Fripp, Ian McDonald, Michael Giles, and Greg Lake. And it's them doing, of course, um, 21st Century Schizoid Man in the Court of the Crimson King epitaph, as well as their cover of Donovan's Get Thy Bearings. These have been released on the Epitaph collection, as well as the 1969 box set. Um, I, For some reason, I doubt that they'll do an official vinyl pressing of the BBC stuff just given that there's only so many sessions that they did there. Uh, so to have something like this cut at 45 RPM on a nice piece of translucent brown vinyl, it's something cool to have. All right, guys, I'm just going to cut to the chase and go in detail about what everyone in the music world has been discussing as of lately. And that is the newly remixed and expanded red and blue albums by the beatles uh these compilations are two solid primers to dig a little deeper into the fab four's body of work that goes a little bit beyond just the number one hits you have b-sides you have album cuts you have singles you have a little bit of everything and i bet for you know back in the day when these first came out in 1973 these were solid gateways for uh, new Beatles fans. And of course, there's an interesting backstory behind how these came to be. There was the Alpha Omega compilation that was being sold. Um, I did a whole video talking about these two comps a couple of years ago, if you want to peel back and check that out. But uh, it's cool that Apple is sort of capitalizing on the 50th anniversary of these sets by doing these newly expanded and remixed versions and also having it tie in with now and then i'll talk about this in a little bit but basically the two lp sets for each of these comps have been expanded with a third lp of bonus cuts um which i think is really solid it kind of dives a little deeper um into their catalog and i think it's also um, much needed in some respects in regards to the Red album, because as much as I love Rubber Soul and it's my favorite Beatles record, way overpresented uh, for Revolver to just have um, Yellow Submarine and Eleanor Rigby. Now that's kind of been evened out because they beefed up the uh, bonus LP with some extra cuts from, from uh, Revolver. And then the Blue album, I always felt was very well in depth so it's cool that they kind of beefed it out further and included some extra material but in regards to the remixing uh giles martin went ahead and did almost all new mixes for all the tracks on this comp uh, with the exception of some of the tracks that appeared on albums that got remixes over the past you know several years um and of course they used um Peter Jackson's uh, MAL demixing technology. And for as exciting as it is to get expanded versions, I'm excited to dig into these new mixes. And it provides some hope that there will be deluxe versions of the early albums to come in the near future. I mean, they have to basically because us Beatle fans will buy it. But these comps are available individually, but as you see here, I got the box set version, which is, it just brings them both together in a nice hard slip case box. But this version is the Beatles Web Store exclusive uh, because these come pressed on red and blue vinyl. And let's face it, if there are any music collections that are deserving of colored variants, it is obviously the red and the blue album. So we'll take all these out and I'll showcase everything. Typically for new Beatles product, I would do a big unboxing video, but my backlog of content on the channel has been quite massive. So I did like a little YouTube short TikTok type unboxing, but if you didn't see that, now's your opportunity. So here we have the red album. We have the outtake from the Please Please Me um, photo session. And then the backside is 1969. This was supposed to be used for the Get Back album, which became Let It Be. Gay fold is replicated. Red tinge on the photo there. And there you see the track list for all six sides of this comp since it's been expanded by one LP. Each volume comes with a little insert with liner notes by John Harris, as well as some photos. All records are housed in printed inner sleeves with all the lyrics, just like the original. And let's take a look at the vinyl. Of course, fitting for the Red album to be pressed on red vinyl. Solid stuff. And then we will dig into the Blue album. 
So here we have that 1969 shot on the front. Backside has the Please Please Me photo. Date fold once again. Insert with liner notes and photos. Printed inners and lovely blue vinyl. So absolutely good stuff. It's a well-assembled package. Um, it's kind of interesting because, um, and I know that many other people have commented on this notion in other um, videos, um, the bonus cuts uh, for these comps are pressed onto one LP, but for CD, um, they're kind of sequenced uh, chronologically. So I don't know if maybe there was an afterthought and they didn't want to scrap the vinyl, or maybe they intended on doing this between the two formats. It's kind of... Um, an oddity type thing, but also minor criticism for the blue album. It is, um, I don't know why they left out free as a bird and real love from the anthologies. If they're going to include now and then on this one, uh, that's my only real gripe because honestly, when it comes to, you know, these kind of things, I'm very easy to please. We're lucky to get this product in general. So I'm excited to dig into some expanded and remixed Beatles comps. And just because I showed it briefly, um, if you saw my video uh, when I went to California, I did pick up the Now and Then 12-inch uh, uh, single on black vinyl. And when I came home, I was able to snag the 7-inch version. Um, I absolutely love this track. I wouldn't say it's the greatest Beatles song, but it is a very nice bookend. And um, it would have been interesting if it came out back in the 90s, but the technology just simply wasn't there to elaborate on John's original demo, which was initially kind of rough in quality, but thanks to Peter Jackson and the demixing technology, it has been brought to life. So here is that. Honestly, this is just a miniature version of the 12 inch because that's the that's the one I was uh, most familiar with before I snagged the seven inch. So we have a little insert here. And of course I opted for the marbled blue vinyl version. And I love how now and then is on the Apple label and it's backed with Love Me Do, and it comes on that original red Parlophone label. It's just a very nice touch. So, obviously, 2023 is a great time to be a Beatles fan, and um, I got a lot of listening to do. All right, guys, Third Man Records Vault Package 57 just arrived today. Tracking was posted in October, and it now just arrived. What's up with that? But needless to say, this is a vault that I am genuinely very excited about. I remember it was announced before I left for New Orleans with the youngest members of the VC, and I was so excited about it. And uh, crazy enough, I was just looking on Discogs. This is basically doubling in value uh, compared to what I pay quarterly for the vault uh, subscription service. So I think this is going to be quite coveted. And I do have to say props to Third Man for branching out further when it comes to these vaults because outside of doing stuff in the Jack White realm with the White Stripes, Raconteurs, and such, um, they do packages centered around other artists such as Captain Beefheart, Carol King, Johnny Cash, Miles Davis, Sleep, and now they are focusing on the solo works of Sid Barrett. Of course, Sid Barrett of the original Pink Floyd. And if you know me well enough, I am a Sid Barrett devotee. Um, I absolutely love his solo records. I love the stuff he did with the Floyd. Uh, just one of those mad genius, tragic hero type of characters and um, in music lore. And um, I think his solo albums are definitely worth exploring and listening to. They have their charm to it. And yes, like there is a distinguishable difference between the stuff he did with the Floyd and the stuff that he did solo. But it still is really, really good and definitely worth listening to. I would say fragmented for lack of a better term, but still very enjoyable but anyways this box set brings together the three solo albums that sid had done well technically two solo albums and then there was the other odds and sods album so it all comes in a nice hardback uh slip case and uh, this illustration is done by greg roof which is like um, a steady one stroke pencil uh drawing of sid and there's his name on the back so the main two albums, we have, of course, Madcap Laughs 
and Barrett. These two records were the main ones that he had put out. Um, some Floyd cross ties here. Um, David and Roger had helped produce this one, and then David and Richard played on this one. Uh, this one, I would say, best represents his work. Um, you have some full band arrangements, you have some acoustic uh, renditions, you have some studio banter and false starts. So it's a very warts and all, fly on the wall type listen. But, uh, but I think it represents him best in terms of his artistry and what he was trying to do. So good stuff on here. And this comes pressed on golden hair colored vinyl. So I, I like how they tie in the colored variants with the song titles. So this is what it looks like. Nice piece of golden hair vinyl. And I love that they went ahead and used the custom third man um, label instead of the harvest label, which is what this originally came out in. And I did have the 2014 Parlophone reissues of these Sid albums, which I did part ways with once this vault was announced. So that's Madcap. And then with Barrett, this is a bit more of a polished kind of record, um, which kind of presents it in a more straightforward manner with, like I said, David Gilmore, Richard Wright, Jerry Shirley of Humble Pie plays drums on this. And uh, there's some other, more great songs on here. Dominoes, Gigolo Ant, Effervescing Elephant, Good stuff. And this one comes pressed on Baby Lemonade colored vinyl. See, it's green. It technically should be yellow, but it's described as Baby Lemonade. And this looks absolutely tremendous. And then years later in the late 80s, EMI had put out Opel. Opel is kind of like the Oz and Sods album. You have some unreleased tracks from the era, some demo versions, alternate takes, and a few other bits and pieces. This is honestly a really solid listen and a great companion to his other albums. And it does kind of break down some recording information here with scans of tape boxes and liner notes on the gatefold. Really solid stuff. And this comes pressed on what is described as Milky Way colored vinyl. So it's like translucent with like black swirls inside, which looks really, really cool. And then as an added bonus, there is also a seven inch right here. And this includes renditions of Sid songs played by David Gilmour. So the A side is devoted to Dark Lobe, uh, which is fantastic. And then he does a jazzy rendition of Dominoes, which is really cool. So that's on the seven inch. And then of course you get this little piece of textured paper that kind of explains the vault on the back there. So all around knock out of the ballpark uh, from Third Man for this vault package. And it's been a long time since, since I've listened to Sid's albums last. Um, I had devoured these records back when I was in high school. And um, it's it's one of those things where like I disappear from them for a while. And then when I come back to it, it's like listening to it for the first time. And this set just really lit a fire under me. So really excited to dig a little bit deeper back into the solo works of Sid Barrett. All right, guys, now it's time for a heavy dosage of Jimi Hendrix. Now, if you follow my channel, you know that I went to California earlier in November and I saw two shows at the Hollywood Bowl, saw Guns N' Roses and Kiss, and I also saw Kiss in Palm Springs uh, before those two shows took place. And the fact that I got to see my favorite band at a legendary venue such as the Hollywood Bowl was very special, just down to the setting of the venue, the way that it's constructed and the history behind it. And to think of all the monumental shows that had took place there, it was truly electrifying to be in the presence in that venue. And when I saw this Hendrix release announced, it almost felt like a good omen when I saw where it was recorded. And of course, it is the Jimi Hendrix experience live at the Hollywood Bowl on August 18th, 1967. Relatively early in Hendrix's career, this was shortly after the Monterey Pop Festival. And honestly, if you are familiar with his set from that fest, then you will absolutely dig this release in terms of the set list. Uh, of course, you have Killing Floor, Wind Cries Mary, Foxy Lady, Catfish Blues, which is pretty cool, Wild Thing, Like a Rolling Stone, Fire, Purple Haze. Uh, it does open up with his cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band, which is always awesome to hear. And uh, it's crazy that the Hendrix estate is still just unearthing these recordings that have never been properly released before. It is insane. I don't know uh, how dry the milk could possibly be in the coming years, but it's absolutely astonishing. 
And as always, the Hendrix releases are always handled so beautifully by the estate. They come with nice booklets and photos and liner notes. There's various pictures taken both backstage and on stage. There's a cool shot of uh, Jimmy with uh, disc jockey uh, Rodney Bingenheimer of uh, K-Rock. Very good stuff. Quality record pressings, of course, presses up all the Hendrix stuff. And I love the design of the center labels on this, how it actually has photos of Hendrix uh, playing, which is really solid. So that's a nice feature there. So definitely excited to give this a listen. And now we get into some rather interesting territory. So this next release um, came out on the same day as the Hollywood Bowl release, but this is marketed as being an Amazon exclusive release. So I was like, okay, looks kind of interesting to uh, check out. And that is the experience live in Paris, 1968 at the Olympia Theater. Uh, this is put out under the Dagger Records imprint, which is a sort of subsidiary label that focuses on sort of bootleg quality type recordings from Hendrix. Um, you have Killing Floor, Catfish Blues, honestly, most of the same stuff that kind of appears on the bull show. Uh, you do get things like Little Wing, which is one, probably my favorite Hendrix song. Uh, Driving South, Red House, some real nice, cool, bluesy type stuff. So this is really, really solid. Some liner notes and photos. And, of course, nice quality record pressing sleeve. And I'll showcase the vinyl as well, just so you guys can see. Kind of basic uh, center labels there. And then next up is a Walmart exclusive. Now this came out to coincide with Walmart's annual kind of Black Friday deals type thing where a selection of records are uh, discounted at $15. Not all records. I think the higher ups found the glitch in their system where every record was ringing up as $15 in years past and they just caught a small selection and they also dropped some fresh exclusives for the event. And this kind of follows what... Uh, the Hendrix Estate has been doing with some of the more extravagant live releases. I'll kind of explain it. It's a single LP version of the the experience live in Maui. Uh, this came out a couple years ago, I believe. It's like a multi LP set. I have it in my collection, and um, for the past couple of years, they have done condensed versions of the Atlanta Pop Festival as well as the Winterland shows, and they've always been available as like Walmart or Target exclusive. So it kind of just depends on the retailer. But this is the newest um, full-length show that's been kind of truncated to one LP. So it's kind of like a highlights type release. Um, hey Baby, New Rising Sun, In From The Storm, Easy Rider, Hear My Train A-Coming, uh, Voodoo Child. So there's a good emphasis on some of the more later era stuff. And this Walmart exclusive comes pressed on Turquoise Colored Vinyl. Which looks really cool with some very nice colorful center labels. So, looks like Hendrix is going to be taking uh, dominance on my turntable with these excellent live releases. Okay, so here is something KISS-related that I think a lot of you KISS vinyl heads out there are really going to appreciate. Uh, when I saw that this was being announced and dropped online, um, I literally had set a reminder for me to get my copy. And I think as of filming this, it has sold out, so I'm very lucky to have been one of the hundreds that got their hands on Bruce Kulick Audio Dogs. So this is Bruce's first album that came out back in 2001 and this is the first time that it has ever gotten a vinyl pressing. I'm going to be totally honest with you. I have not listened to a lick off this album, but just given how crucial and integral Bruce was to my favorite band in the 80s going into the 90s during the non-makeup period. Something like this is definitely necessary to have as a KISS fan. I do have his album BK3 in my collection, but um, now I can start at the beginning of his solo ventures with Audio Dog. And I just have to say, I love the little KISS Easter eggs on the cover because you have the Statue of Liberty from the Revenge Tour and the Sphinx from Hot in the Shade. So I think that's really cool. Here is the back cover. Nice printed inner sleeve with some liner notes and photos of Bruce. And the pressing that I opted for was the blue vinyl pressing. And my copy also came with a bonus 7-inch with a track called uh, 495. And there's an alternate version of the song Liar that appears on the album. And the 7-inch comes pressed 
on red vinyl as well. So really stoked to get some solo material from Bruce and dig my way into his first solo album, Audio Dog. All right, next up, these next couple of releases all coincidentally have something to do with the great city of brotherly love, and that is Philadelphia. Starting off with a new release by one of my favorite indie rockers, and that is Kurt Vile, Back to Moon Beach. Uh, Kurt likes to sprinkle in uh, EPs throughout his album cycles, and of course his latest one being the one for his last full-length record, uh, Watch My Moves, which came out back in 2022. And uh, this right here is actually a direct-to-consumer exclusive um uh, pressing from his website uh, because the main EP I think consists of about six to seven songs roughly and this direct-to-consumer version includes a bonus LP of extra cuts some of which are sung by Kurt's daughters Awalda and Delphine so I figured this would be uh, a really cool variant just because you're getting more with the actual product instead of you know fancy indie exclusive colored vinyl and things like that so very cool release overall and I'm excited to dig into this some of the tracks on here actually date back to before when uh watch my moves um was released like years before that so it's interesting kind of how these songs have been kind of sitting around uh, because if you follow kurt on social media you know that he is always recording stuff and collaborating with a bunch of different artists so um this is a cool little testament to that and i have sung kurt's praises many times on my channel and other videos but the best way to kind of describe his work is like Neil Young meets John Prine meets Tom Petty. It's like psychedelic Americana, stream of flow, um, you know, lyrics and such. Very witty. So if you're into that kind of thing, definitely check out Kurt Vile Back to Moon Beach. And now here is an album that actually got a vinyl debut pressing. This album actually first came out back in 2011. And I have a lot of fond memories of listening to this back when I was in middle school and high school. And this is actually the artist that my best friend Chelsea and I, you might know her as the record spinnerette. Uh, we actually bonded over when we were young and when we first became friends. And um, this artist is kind of like a long chain in our line of friendship. And for years, we always talked about if this record would ever get released on vinyl. Because when it first came out, it was only on CD and digital. And now that Atlantic Records is doing the whole 75th anniversary celebration, they're pressing up a bunch of uh, their catalog back onto vinyl. And this album is getting a vinyl debut treatment. And that is... Love Strong by Christina Perry. Um, she's perhaps best known for doing the song A Thousand Years, which appeared in the Twilight films. Uh, but the big hit on here was Jar of Hearts, which debuted on television and she didn't even have a record deal. So Atlanta kind of signed her kind of to ride the coattails. But um, this album is absolutely great. If you're into like Sarah Barry Ellis, Natalie Merchant, Alanis Morissette, you will definitely dig this record. And um I remember when I put on the turntable, I just got little waves of nostalgia back when I was young listening to this on repeat. So it's an absolutely gorgeous record. Uh, very rich in instrumentation and arrangements. And uh, she wears a heart on her sleeve. So if you want a nice, emotional, vulnerable listen, then this is definitely an album for you. And because I mentioned it's the 75th anniversary of Atlantic Records, they went ahead and did the classic colored um not colored clear vinyl uh pressing which to be honest i think matches the sort of aesthetic of the sort of gray overtones of the album artwork so i think they really succeeded with pairing the clear vinyl with this particular album so very happy that this got a vinyl debut release and definitely one that was much wanted in my collection now, for any of my Philadelphia-based viewers, or if you're a fan of Philly sports, I'm sure you have seen and heard all about this particular release, and that is a Philly special Christmas special. So this album consists of players on the Philadelphia Eagles football team singing Christmas songs. So you have them singing tracks such as the Christmas song, Dominic the Donkey, Christmas Time is Here, All I Want for Christmas is You, uh, Audland Son. Um, all kinds of good stuff. It's a good bit of fun, and I love the way that it looks. It looks like, you know, a sort of adaptation of, you know, the Charlie Brown Christmas, which is a staple by any means. And there's a little Sgt. Pepper type moment where you can see um, caricatures of all the individuals involved with the making of this album, which I will show off in a minute. Here is the printed inner sleeve. 
And then the back has the cast of characters. And of course, on here you have Patti LaBelle, Ammo Slee, Waxahachie, Lil Dicky appears on here. So a lot of people are involved with this record. So if you are, are at all a Philadelphia aficionado, definitely seek this out. And it comes pressed on red vinyl. Now, this is the latest one that came out this year. There was another one that came out last year, and these are typically only available on a special website for 75 bucks. Sounds steep, but all the proceeds go to local Philadelphia charities. And what's really special is that um, at the record store that I work at, uh, we were able to work up a deal where we could actually sell these as part of Record Store Day Black Friday. And all of the proceeds uh, from our sales of this actually went to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And um, my best friend Chelsea had a baby at 25 weeks. Her name is Topanga. And I am so blessed to actually be able to call her my niece. And um, the fact that, you know, me buying this record and supporting the hospital that she is at just kind of made it more of an incentive for me to pick this up and uh, donate to a very special as well as an important cause. All right, guys, Real Gone Music has finally finished the reissue campaign of the early Donna's catalog. Earlier this year, we got reissues of their debut, an American Teenage Rock and Roll Machine. And now we have Get Skin Tight and the Donna's turned 21. And these are the last two records that they did on Lookout before they got signed to Atlantic Records. And out of these two, Get Skin Tight is the one I think I am most familiar with. Um, definitely has a little bit of everything on this record for it to be considered one of their finest albums. Uh, the opening track, Skin Tight, is great. Hyperactive, You Don't Want to Call, which is one of their most musically mature songs and their entire um, arsenal of tracks. Uh, they also have their version of uh, Motley Crue's Too Fast for Love, which is fantastic. I would say this is a good hybrid between the early fast-paced kind of punk stuff on their debut and the more glammed hard rock stuff on... Um, rock and roll machine so this is absolutely solid and it, this does come with a four panel insert which has candid photos lyrics and liner notes which is really cool and this is a Zia Records exclusive. This as well as Turn 21 are both Zia exclusives. I figured I would keep it in that vein just because I have the other two albums that Real Gone um, has done earlier this year as Zia exclusive. So it's the, it's the sake of keeping everything unison. And this comes pressed on pink vinyl, which looks absolutely tremendous. And then, of course, the other record that they did is the Donna's Turn 21. Uh, this kind of streamlines the more commercialized hard rock sound that they would tap into on their major label debut, which is uh, Spend the Night. But on this one, you have Are You Gonna Move It For Me? Do You Wanna Hit It? Uh, 40 Boys and 40 Nights. Uh, their cover of uh, Judas Priest's uh, Living After Midnight is on here, which is pretty solid. And um, I do have to say, this is one that I typically don't like really revisit all too much. I've kind of been waiting for these vinyl reissues to come out to just really sink my teeth. For as much as I love the Donnas and everything else that I've listened to that has been pressed on vinyl in recent years, um, I don't know, it just seems more authentic and then I can kind of dig my way in. But uh, this does come with an insert with fresh liner notes as well as lyrics. And this comes pressed on what's described as sort of velvet purple colored vinyl this is also limited to 300 it has like a rich kind of purple hue to it but if you sh shine it in a light you see it looks like a i don't know it has like a purple and bluish and pinkish kind of marbled effect to it you have to see it in the light to really check it out for yourself but nonetheless thank you real gone for giving us a reissue campaign that has been much deserved and um perhaps we'll see some unreleased stuff come out in the woodwork we shall see, but otherwise, really excited to dig deeper into these records. Okay, so I'm filming this clip on the eve of KISS's final show at Madison Square Garden, which is taking place tomorrow on Saturday, December 2nd, which I will be in attendance at. And I am honestly not ready for the emotional roller coaster that that is going to be, along with some of the other cool stuff that's going on in the city, because Kiss is doing the whole New York City takeover uh, with their own pop-up shop. And then there was the Empire State Building light show that commenced, which was pretty cool, as well as photo ops at various Kiss landmarks and things like that. So it's going to be an absolutely great time. And... Um, 
not necessarily to tie in with the festivities, but more so miraculous timing, there is a new KISS record out in the form of a Walmart exclusive pressing, and that is of the Icon compilation. So Icon is a series that is put out by Universal, and they're just basic budget, you know, type of compilations of certain artists in their um in their roster, KISS being one of them. Now, interestingly enough, this uh, KISS Icon comp came out back in 2010, but in reality, this is simply a more bare-bones repackaging of the first 20th Century Masters um, Volume 1 compilation that came out around, I want to say, 2003, 2004, right around that time. And I do have to say, for this comp focusing on the 70s from debut up to Dynasty, um, this really does a solid job at providing a concise primer of the early years. So when it comes to like a sort of kiss comp to kind of slowly dip your toes into, I gotta say the 20th century masters slash icon comp is a solid place to start. I mean, just look at the track list right there. That is as to the point as it gets with this particular release. And this, like I said, is a Walmart exclusive, which comes pressed on silver vinyl with black splatter, which very much fits the Kiss aesthetic very, very nicely. And honestly, I'm kind of curious if maybe there will be other icon comps uh, to come from Kiss uh, as Walmart exclusive pressings, whether it be focusing on the 80s or the 90s. We shall see. But nonetheless, this was a pleasant little surprise and one that I'm definitely going to have a lot of uh, fun spinning on the turntable. Okay, so I did a video showcasing what I got from this year's Record Store Day Black Friday. And while I did manage to basically get everything that I kind of was out to get, there were a couple of trinklets of leftover releases that weren't necessarily scalped up by resellers and were still relatively av available for decent prices after the craze of Black Friday had kind of died down. So I kind of took a look and saw what was out on the market that I kind of missed initially, and I decided to get them for uh, some solid prices. Starting off with Joni Mitchell, Court and Spark demos. Uh, this is another archival Joni Mitchell release. Uh, Rhino in recent years has been doing a fantastic job with Joni's uh, recorded output, putting out box sets of unreleased demos and live material, as well as box sets of certain albums of, from certain eras. And uh, it's a great way for me to kind of dig into Joni's work because I do love the sort of folky stuff that she does, uh, but also dive a little bit deeper beyond just the main discography with releases like this. And I'll be honest, Court and Spark is an album that I have not listened to yet. It is one that is quite notable in her discography, to the best of my knowledge. So I think hearing these embryonic versions will give me some nice insight as to what to expect on the final version once I get round to listening to the actual album itself. So as you can see, nice bit of gold inlay there with the text. And this is a Record Store Day exclusive pressing limited to 6,000 copies, I believe. Nice heavyweight black vinyl with some beautiful custom labels. And also, here's a nice little rough scan of the demo tape box as well, which is pretty cool. So happy to get my hands on the Joni Mitchell release. Dive a little bit deeper into her artistry. Next up here is another cool ACDC related type release. Um, this particular band that this ACDC member was in got a record store day release earlier this year that I think I got as a leftover as well. So there's a little bit of a pattern here. And that is Fraternity Second Chance. Now Fraternity was Bon Scott's pre-ACDC band, very much in like the psych Rog kind of vein, which is a total 180 from what he would delve into with ACDC. But basically, this collection brings together singles, alternate versions, as well as unreleased tracks. So I figured this would be a nice little deep dive into that early work. So there you can see Bon Scott right there on the vocal mic. This is a two LP set, does also come with a nice little booklet. There's Bon right there liner notes in photos and all kinds of good stuff here so you can kind of get some context of the time frame when this band was active and this comes pressed 
on purple vinyl and both LPs come pressed on that colored vinyl, which is pretty solid. So really excited to dig into some more fraternity. And that's what I got for Record Store Day Black Friday Leftovers. Now, on the new release side of things that just came out as regular releases, these came out on the same day as Record Store Day Black Friday in the prog vein of one of the prog giants and greats, and that is Jethro Tull. We're going to start off with a reissue that kind of fits the line of the other reissues that have come out in recent years of the Tull catalog, and that is... The Broadsword and the Beast. Uh, this is the latest Jethro Tull album to get the Stephen Wilson remix treatment. Yes, there's a big lavish box set, which comes with unreleased uh, recordings and surround sound mixes and things. And there's even actually a deluxe vinyl pressing of that with all the extra content and such with the main album. But because they have done this line of just the remixed albums, I was kind of waiting for them to do a standalone release of Broadsword since it's the next tall album that I need in my collection. And also to, um, to as of right now, complete the series. I, I'm hoping that they'll do more albums. But um, I was really hoping that they would do a single LP version. So sure enough, I got my hands on that. And uh, these remixes always sound great. And what I love about these vinyl pressings is that you know, sure, they do replicate the original artwork with the original printed inner sleeves, as well as the period-appropriate chrysalis label, but they also come with these very nice booklets with photos, uh, liner notes by uh, Ian Anderson, track-by-track -track breakdowns, all kinds of good stuff. So this is a nice deep dive as you listen to the album. So very happy that uh, this tall record uh, got the single LP remix treatments, and um, it's one that I'm definitely um, not too familiar with. Uh, this was kind of right after that sort of golden period in the late 70s, which they kind of embraced the whole folk kind of prog kind of genre, which is my favorite era of Tall. But um, definitely excited to um, give this a thorough listen, to say the least. And then we get into some classic Tall um, territory here with a sort of companion release to one of their standard classic records, and that is War Child 2. Now, this collection brings together various associated recordings from the sessions for the War Child album from 1974. So as you can see here, this is the track list. All of these tracks do appear on the 40th anniversary box set that came out back in 2014 for this album. Uh, but this time around, they went ahead and they basically sequenced an entire album's worth of material from that bonus um, uh, material. And it even breaks down where all these tracks came from, from various compilations, other box sets, singles, and this and that. So it's really solid. Great band photo. There's Ian Anderson on the front. This also comes with a nice printed inner sleeve with all the lyrics, another shot of Ian, and also, because it's from the 70s, you got that green chrysalis label. So, happy to see uh, Parlophone and Rhino generate some fresh Jethro Tull vinyl products, and who's to say maybe this is the first of its kind? Maybe we'll see, I don't know, a minstrel, you know, in the gallery too, or... Songs from the Wood 2, or anything like that. Needless to say, I'll be buying it up. All right, guys, now it's time for a heavy dosage of MoFi pressings. Most of these are upgrades to what I had previously in my collection, and then one is actually an album that I've never owned before uh, in my collection. Starting off with one of the greatest albums of the 1990s, and it's a pressing that I know for a fact is out of print. Um, I don't know if there's any plans to repress it or anything, but um, these first two were actually... Um, brought in at the shop that I work at via a trade-in. And let's just face it, when it comes to audiophile pressings in general, whether it be MoFi, analog productions, etc., you just don't really see them come in way too much, at least for me. So this was a big deal. And I had already had the 2016 direct metal mastered pressing of this album in my collection, which sounded decent, but I knew this was going to sound better. And that is Weezer's Blue Album. Um, honestly, for as active as these guys are to this day, this will still probably always be their greatest record. It's just, you. how can you top this? My name is Jonas. No one else. Buddy Holly, Undone the Sweater Song, Say It Ain't So, 
only in dreams. This album is in, is sensational from start to finish. And as you can see, it is indeed numbered. But what's cool is that uh, MoFi never does colored vinyl pressings. Uh, but with this Weezer album, and how fitting is it because it's the blue album, it's pressed on blue vinyl and it sounds absolutely tremendous. It had been a hot minute since I last spanned my 2016 uh, DMM pressing, but this just blew it out of the water. It's in your face, it's huge, it fills the room. It is so righteous. So I am so happy that I got my hands on this. Oh, it's I'm still reeling over it. And then moving on to something in the more 80s, hard rock glam kind of vein. Um, this is one of the cool things that I, I do love about MoFi is that they are able to kind of dabble in a little bit of everything. Um, and it's not a knock towards analog productions because let's face it, there's a lot of jazz and a lot of blues and such in there, but it's great that they ventured a bit heavier uh, with this particular choice of release. And that is Twisted Sister, Stay Hungry. This pressing sounds absolutely tremendous as well. Um, I had a pink and black colored vinyl pressing from like the late 2010s already, which was okay. It looked great, um, but I think to my recollection, it sounded okay. So once I played this, it just sounded absolutely tremendous. Of course, they format it into a gatefold jacket, which is nice, tip-on style, of course. And then I'll show you the label as well, which looks pretty solid. And then next up is actually a new MoFi release that just recently came out. And they are doing the entire early catalog of this particular band. And I think I just kind of gave it away what exactly this could be. But needless to say, if I'm debating if I should get the entire series. But if there's one that I have to have, it is the debut of Van Halen. And of course, this is the Ultra Disc One Step Pressing. Um, I had a 2010s reissue that was mastered by Chris Bellman, which sounds great, uh, but 2LP, 45 RPM, how can you say no? And also just this album in general, it's perfect. Um, what I do like about these One Steps now is that they've kind of condensed the packaging. So instead of the lift up box and having it be a little bulky, they kind of slimmed it down a little bit and they kept it to the bare bones essentials. So here's my number as well. Nice hologram sticker there. And yes, it does break down the whole process. Analog mastered, DSD, yada, yada, yada. And it does come with this nice sort of thick insert, which has the original master recording band on top, opens it up. This is basically the printed inner sleeve that came with the original album, original back cover, two LPs and their own individual jackets. And I do have to say, I like how they put these like little white thick kind of board cards that house uh, the records inside. This is a nice little deluxe touch. And this comes pressed on sort of translucent uh, vinyl. It's part of the formulation, which does result in a quiet playback. Can't really see it um, on camera, but if you like shine it to a light, it's a bit of like a hazy sort of transparency, uh, which is pretty cool. So, and there's plans to do all of the other uh, Roth era Van Halen albums. They're doing Van Halen 2, Women and Children First, Diver Down, Fair Warning, 1984. So I'm sure those will probably all come out sometime uh, next year. And um, I'm kind of deciding if I should get them all because honestly with the debut, like I said, it was a must. So we shall see, but I'm really stoked to hear this. And now moving on to the album that I've never owned in my collection. And because I picked up the release of their performance at the Monterey Pop Festival and I was really loving what I heard, um, it made me want to check this album out even further. And that is Cheap Thrills by Big Brother and The Holding Company, of course, featuring Janis Joplin. And um, this is absolutely solid stuff. Ball and Chains on here uh, and several others. Uh, Peace of My Heart, of course, that's the big notable one. And this is another 2LP, 45 RPM uh, pressing. And of course, as you can see, it does state Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab instead of Original Master Recording, uh, which basically means that it's either um, a tape copy or some other best source. Um, don't know if there's any DSD on this. I would have to double check. But overall, solid package. Great photo of the band on the gatefold. There's Janice herself. 
And like I said, 2 LP, 45 RPM, really stoked to experience this album in this deluxe fashion. All right, guys, so here is the newest Third Man Vault package that just recently came out. And compared to the whole Sid Barrett Pony Express debacle, as I like to call it, this one came in a very timely fashion. Now, when this was announced a couple months ago, I was very excited, just down to the backstory behind this particular release and the scarcity of it. So I think that uh, Third Man is doing a major justice by making this more readily available for fans and collectors who don't necessarily have the means to fork out the heavy big bucks that original pressings go for. And when I explain the backstory, you'll kind of understand why. And that is the White Stripes live in Las Vegas. So back in September of 2003, um, the White Stripes played the joint at the Hard Rock in Vegas, and their label at the time, V2 Records, did this special uh, promotional thing where they flew out 40 fans, they got to meet Jack and Meg, see them perform, and then they received a vinyl pressing of that specific show. And only 100 copies uh, were pressed at the time. No jackets, just plain white inner sleeves with a rubber stamp on the labels that say the White Stripes Live in Las Vegas. And just like I said, 100 copies exist, and you can imagine what the value of that t will tend to be. So flash forward 20 years later, right uh, now 2023 is the anniversary of the White Stripes Elephant, and we've gotten vault packages, we've gotten UHQRs, and now we get a re-release of a much-coveted White Stripes live album. And um, to make it special and exclusive for the vault, they went ahead... Um, and remixed it from the original multi-tracks, remastered it, etc., as well as give it proper artwork designed by Rob Jones, who has done um, plenty of work with the White Stripes in the past. He's uh, designed other um, vault packages and things and such, as well as posters as well. He's a very notable uh, poster designer. And this comes in a gorgeous triple gatefold jacket. Here's the track list inside. Opens up like this, absolutely stunning. And as you can imagine, three LPs pressed on red, white, and black vinyl. I'm not going to take out everything, but you get the general gist of what they'll look like. But it's absolutely gorgeous. All pressed in, uh, in Detroit at Third Man Pressing. And you also get a lot of nice goodies with this particular package as well. So we have the textured uh, sheet here, which kind of gives the backstory behind the show, as well as explain the uh, specs of the... Um, of the package we also get a very nice patch which is pretty cool nice little bumper sticker as well we also have these two nice art prints as well which is cool and then there's also a seven inch uh devoted to the song uh, ball and biscuit side a features uh jack white and bob dylan playing the song live in detroit in 2004 and then the b side is the first time the song ever got a live airing by the white stripes in uh, 2002 at the um, shepherd's bush empire in england and i'm gonna take out the uh, the seven inch and show you guys what this looks like because it looks really really cool and that is pressed on red sparkle vinyl which looks absolutely beautiful tremendous stuff here and honestly an all-around knock out of the ballpark in regards to third man with this special white stripes live in las vegas vault package and in just the matter of a snap i lost a couple of inches of hair it's absolutely crazy it looks healthier too so for the past couple of months, I have been talking about uh, the 75th anniversary of Atlantic Records, and there have been um, a series of clear vinyl reissues of certain albums from the label to kind of commemorate the label's anniversary. And there is another line of reissues uh, that commemorate the anniversary, courtesy of Analog Productions. And let me just tell you, they pulled out the big guns with quite an extensive list of albums that they have and will be reissuing in 2LP 45 RPM vinyl pressings as well as Super Audio CDs all mastered from analog sources or the or the next best, you know, copy that they can get their hands on and this is exciting because, and this has always been one of my criticisms of analog productions as much as I prefer them to MoFi is that this series has a lot of great 
rock titles and that's always been my criticism with them is that they've always done jazz you know and blues and such and granted you know we've gotten rock reissues from analog productions we got the doris catalog beach boys hendrix uhqrs jethro tall uhqrs they just did the white stripes so they're starting to now kind of get into some cool raucous territory that goes to show that you know guys like me who like to let their hair down and rock out can also be audiophiles too so the first couple of releases that I've got uh, from this campaign, uh, one of them is actually an album that I think works very well in the 2LP 45 RPM uh, route, and that is Genesis Selling England by the Pound. To me, this is both my favorite Genesis record, and I think it's their best album, honestly. Um, it It is so quintessentially English. And it has so many great highlights on here. I Know What I Like, which was a big single. Uh, Firth or Fifth, Cinema Show, um, Dancing with the Moonlit Night is great. Um, it, this album is just absolutely beautiful. And what's great with this vinyl pressing alone is that this is the first time in roughly 20 years that the original mix has been pressed back onto vinyl. Because what we've had previously in terms of vinyl reissues from Genesis, are the uh, 2000s Nick Davis remixes, which either you love or you absolutely hate. Um, I'm kind of in the middle. I, I see where they have their advantages, but of course the original is always going to be the blueprint for improvements. So it's great that we now have an all-analog reissue of that original mix, and this is cut directly from the master tape, and for the first time it's made into a nice tip-on gatefold jacket with lyrics as well as a band photo and just for the sake of showcasing the vinyl it does come on that infamous mad hatter charisma label nice heavyweight vinyl and i am so stoked to spin this on the turntable because like i said this is my favorite genesis album and then keeping it in the Genesis vein, we also have the first solo album by Phil Collins, Face Value. Of course, on this you have In the Air Tonight with that infamous drum fill. Um, I Missed Again, uh, he also does an interesting version of Behind the Lines, which is on the Genesis album Duke. And uh, even rounds off with his own cover of the Beatles' uh, Tomorrow Never Knows, which is pretty fun. And um, I can gladly say that I parted ways with my reissue of Face Value that had his older face on the cover, whereas this was faithful as it was back in 1981 when this album first came out. So it's nice that I could part ways with that and get my hands on this gatefold jacket with some handwritten messages from Phil, as well as some photos and Polaroids and such. And I'll even showcase the Atlantic labels here, which are kind of unique for this album because it has this fancy little bubble style writing as well as uh, Phil's handwriting as well, which is pretty nice. Now, according to the back of the jacket, this was cut from a quarter inch EQ Dolby tape copy of the original master tape. So like I said, next best available source. And then next up is one of my favorite classic rock albums from the mid to late 70s. And when it comes to this band, their first couple of albums are what really just take the gold for me. Some of the more, you know, sappy ballad type stuff I'm not too big on personally. But you absolutely cannot deny the swagger of Farner's uh, self-titled debut album from 1977 and um, this of course features feels like the first time cold as ice star rider which is great head knocker long long way from home um, this is just a fantastic debut album and a fantastic lineup too of course you have Lou Graham Mick Jones um, Ed Gagliardi um, Ian McDonald Dennis Elliott and um, I believe who's the other guy that I'm missing who is it Al Greenwood that's the guy so nice 2LP 45 RPM pressing. And I should have mentioned too, um, I believe Genesis and Phil Collins were mastered by Chris Bellman, whereas Farner's uh, debut was mastered by Ryan K. Smith. So it goes to show that at uh, Analog Productions Arsenal, they are working with some of the finest mastering engineers out there in the business. And there's that classic Atlantic label right there as well. So absolutely solid. And uh, prior to getting... Uh, this pressing, I did have the MoFi press of Farner's debut, and to my understanding, that was um, transferred to DSD from the original master, 
And no, that is not why I upgraded to this. You know, just when you think about it, single LP 33 versus two LP 45, there is going to be a difference and I cannot wait to hear it. Okay, so I'm filming this clip on Christmas morning. So I hope everyone out there watching had a fantastic Christmas. I certainly did. And there's a small stack of records I'm going to show you that I got. Uh, but before I get into those, I'm going to show you guys real quick some of the other cool music-related items that I got for Christmas that I think all of you guys will appreciate. Starting off with the one item that caught my eye the most that was part of Kiss's holiday collection from this year that was uploaded to their web store. And that is... The Destroyer 76 scarf, as you see here, has the band's logo, the band as they appear on the album cover, album name, the year it came out, 76, along with some flame graphics. I just love the old school look of this scarf. I can imagine someone like at a show like waving this up in the air. I just think it looks absolutely sick. And it's very heavy duty and industrial, so this will definitely keep me warm during the brisk months of the year. So very happy that I got this Kiss scarf. Also got this cool little handmade Kiss ornament, which is really cool. Almost as like a 3D printed plastic resin type deal uh, with the band's logo in gold. You got them in their end of the road outfits along with some Santa hats kind of placed uh, artificially on the top. Um, this just looks absolutely cool. When I saw this in the box that came in, I was like, oh shit, this looks absolutely solid. So this will hang up nicely on the Christmas tree. And for those that don't know, I am a bit of a uh, music bibliophile. And there's a couple of books that uh, caught my eye recently that I kind of just held off on getting. And I'll just wait till Christmas to get them. Uh, starting off with The White Stripes, Complete Lyrics, 97 to 07. Third Man Books has recently put this out. And it's literally just a book of all of the White Stripes lyrics that have appeared on albums, singles, compilations. There's also some photos kind of sprinkled in throughout the book. And even in the back, there's some scans of handwritten lyrics and things. So this is a nice little anthology to have sitting on my bookshelf. And here is a very geeky one. So this is uh, Pink Floyd, BBC Radio, 1967 to 71. Uh, this book chronicles all of Pink Floyd's appearances at the BBC from this time frame. Uh, the initial recording sessions, when they were rebroadcasted, there's scans of reels and tape boxes from the BBC archives. Also talks about some of the, um, the archivists that taped them off air, what sources sound great, bootlegs, the early years box set um it's not an official book put out by pink floyd um this came out in the netherlands i believe a couple years back but um given that this is focused on my favorite period of the floyd and i love the bbc radio sessions that they did uh this is going to be quite the immersive deep dive into uh this little facet of pink floyd's history Going back to KISS territory, Julian Gill over at KISS FAQ just put out Mask Hysteria World Tour 1980 to 81. This is a book focused all about the Unmasked Tour from 1980. So this kind of is like a breakdown of the tour itself, the Unmasked album, show by show, uh, various um, print ads, contracts, articles, um, seven inch sleeves, and just all kinds of um info regarding this period there's a little bit of the elder towards the tail end um this is an absolutely fantastic book beautifully put together and it's been getting all the praise by uh kiss fans out there so i'm very happy to have this book in my collection and now we're gonna dig into vinyl so if you saw in the last segment of this haul um i was talking about the analog productions um atlantic record 75th anniversary collab well, I did get one of those releases, and this is probably so far the most heavy-duty release that they have put out as part of this series. Um, and this is an album that, as huge as it is already as a regular double album, this is now a quadruple album. And that is Genesis, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. A concept album about a, a Puerto Rican named Rail who goes through the underground... Um, Tunnels of New York City. It's a Pilgrim's Progress type storyline. Um, it's an absolutely immersive record. And um, Analog Productions was ballsy enough to turn this in from a double to a quadruple LP uh, at 45 RPM. Cut all analog. Now, because this is actually from Acoustic Sounds, my copy is numbered. 
Um, I'm not sure if this album in general is limited or they just um, number all the stuff that comes from um, the acoustic sound site because the ones that I got from my distros um, aren't numbered. So I don't know if there's a distinguished factor there. But I like what they did though with the gatefold essentially. So you have the regular gatefold here and then they essentially turned the printed inner sleeves into pockets of the gatefold. So it's, it's almost like a book style type deal which is pretty cool. And also the spine is really thick as well. And um, what I have previously in my collection of the original mix of the lamb is the classic records uh, pressing from 2001, which I am going to part ways with since I now have this and this will just get me by perfectly at 45 RPM. So this is really, really solid. And now basically the rest are unofficial pressings. Um, we have Rush's Vapor Trails here. Uh, this is a recent unofficial press that I've seen circulate as of recently. Came close to getting it when I was out in California, but I held off just because I do have the remixed version on vinyl officially. Uh, there was a vinyl pressing done of this album when it first came out back in 2002, um, but it's kind of pricey. And um, the original mix um, has always been very uh, criticized for being brick walled and such. But because, you know, I love Rush and I'm a collector, this right here has the original artwork as well as the original mix, which is pretty solid to have just, you know, from a collector standpoint. And this uh, pressing comes on orange vinyl, which is pretty solid. So got some Rush. Here is a release that I completely missed out on when it came out first for Record Store Day. Um, and it's fetching some high values. I tried to get it once for a decent price, but it just completely fell through. And um, there's an unofficial out of it. So I finally got my hands on it. And that is Linkin Park's One More Light Live. Uh, this is a live album that essentially came out um, after Chester Bennington had passed away. So they put this out to kind of you know, in, in, in memoriam of Chester. And it's essentially just a live uh, record from the One More Light tour. There's Chester on the back there. And uh, it's nice to have a, a copy of this live album since I do love me some Linkin Park, one of my favorite middle school bands. Definitely one that's close to me in terms of nostalgia uh, purposes. And this comes pressed on pink vinyl, which is pretty cool. And last but not least, we have a couple of KISS titles. Now, it's funny. I uploaded an updated KISS vinyl collection video um, on Christmas Day, and yet right now it's outdating itself already. So it'll be some time before I do KISS record collection 3.0, essentially. Um, here we have an unofficial press of Crazy Nights. I already have the 2014 reissue, but this is interesting because, yes, it's unofficial, and because it's Kiss, I gotta have it. Uh, but, as you see, it features the German logo. I don't have a German press of Crazy Nights in my collection with this logo. So, to kill two cool birds with one stone, German logo and unofficial is pretty cool. And this does come with an interesting printed inner sleeve it's a bit weird just blow ups of the um album cover this is pressed on solid red vinyl and the last record i'm going to show is actually a bootleg i'll just give it a brief mention i'll go more into you know specific details when i do like the next big kiss bootleg haul but uh, this is Austin Loves It Loud. Uh, this is live in Austin, Texas in September of 2021. Um, I mainly just chose this um, on my Christmas list just because it was relatively inexpensive to get. And I did see them um, when they resumed touring in 2021. I caught the Atlantic City show for the end of the road tour. And that was the closest I ever was for a Kiss show. Third row. Cannot beat that. And this comes pressed on marbled blue vinyl so overall a very solid christmas or should i say kissmas so there you guys go that is my vinyl haul of all the records that i acquired within the months of november and december in 2023 if you enjoyed this video please go ahead give it a like and subscribe to the channel see you guys in the next video and most importantly keep the records spinning